Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for taking time to join us for the first OER AST research webinar for 2023, titled Nurturing Future Ready and Lifelong Learners. I'm Trevina Kang from the National Institute of Education, NTU, and I'll be your host and moderator this afternoon. This afternoon's theme is a very important one. There is widespread acknowledgement that our future economy, society, and life in general is going to be increasingly challenging and complex. But I dare say that as educators, this realization takes on an additional gravitas, not just because we are worried or concerned about our own futures, but because we have a responsibility and mission to nurture the young people under our charge. We are tasked to nurture them to be future ready and ready to learn for life. But what should we prioritize? What directions should we take? How do we do things differently? Uh, what can we do things better? So these are the questions that our invited speakers, who are forerunners in research, in policy and practice, will seek to unpack for us. Uh, now it gives me pleasure to introduce the first keynote speaker for today, Associate Professor David Ng. David is the Associate Dean for Academic Quality at the NIE, an Associate Professor at the Policy Curriculum and Leadership Academic Group at the NIE. David is internationally recognized for his expertise in complexity, instructional and distributed leadership. But his current passion is actually about reframing educational success and future ready learners. In today's presentation, he'll be sharing on what is critical for the future and what the education system should focus on to ensure future success. David, please. Share my screen. Thank you very much, Trevina, for the kind introduction. Okay, let me just get this one up. Uh, very good afternoon to all. Uh, and it's good to know that many of you are here, though I cannot see anyone else except the, the panel and the and the organizers. Uh, but this afternoon, what I would like to do is in a very short sharing uh, to outline the process and the basis to determine future readiness direction, right? So I'll start with this is that uh, education serves three universal purposes. And these are purposes that are followed and abide by all, every country in the world, right? So the purpose is to develop learners for living, develop learners for life work and for learning. So the key question then we look at future readiness is that uh, what's the basis to determine and a process to determine the future readiness in living and life work and learning, right? So what I'll do here is to bring us through very briefly, just a snapshot of it here, to identify country specific context. And in this case here, Singapore. Singapore's context itself, because we are developing future ready learners for Singapore first and then for the world. So what is Singapore's context? Right, in the aspect of uh, development for life work. We'll start with that first, okay? So, uh, of course, then you have to look at the context of the economics uh, in, in, in Singapore. So this is a snapshot of it here and a trend as well. So you see this trend here, the services trend is an increasing trend from all the way before 1995 to now 20, uh, 19, right? You see this services trend as an increasing trend. And industry in the economic sector is a declining trend, whereas agriculture is just flat, almost flat line, right? So to give you a better perspective of this trend here, the context in Singapore from the economic perspective, then you take a look at this here is that in industries, this particular sector contributes 24.92% to the GDP and has a labor force or employ 15.56%, right? Agriculture generates 5.63% to the GDP, employs 0.03% of the labor force. Services is the bulk of the employment, 84.41% and contribute to almost 70% to the GDP. So at a glance, if you take a look at it here, if you look at 10 students in the schools, and if they were to finish the school today, you're going to expect that eight and a half of them 
will end up in jobs related to services. Okay, so just for a quick note, this is the increasing trend of uh, employment in services and also, of course, contribution to the GDP in the economics. Right? So services is different from industries in one aspect, is that services is not product driven. We do not manufacture any, anything. But services is about applying knowledge, applying knowledge to solve problems and to provide solutions. Okay, And so services then therefore require the staff to be to be to have first and foremost deep mastery of whatever they have learned in school and then after that take that learning and being able to apply it in various kind of settings for example ICT in manufacturing in, in, in uh, um, managing and learning transportation and all those things here in order to provide solution so this is the trend that we can expect in, in, in Singapore and so let's take a look at the second aspect of the uh, purpose, which is about developing our learners for uh, living right, in a society, the cultural aspect of it here. So as I said, we always go back to the central purposes of education. So if you're going to develop our learners for society, for living in the future, what's the future like? What's current like? And what is the future could possibly be like? So here is again a snapshot of that. This is Ingerhart and Vess's World Cultural Map. And it places Singapore almost right in the middle of this, uh, the y-axis and the x-axis here. And for example, if you take a, take a look at the x-axis, it is a contrast between survival values and self-expression values, okay? And so here, survival values are defined by a focus on economic, physical activities, and less trust on people and government and so on, okay? So we are in, this particular juncture now being identified in this particular world map as a balanced view in terms of survival and self-expression and uh, slowly increasing towards secular values in terms of the way we look at traditional versus secular values. Okay? Now, this is an important point in time for us to think and consider because we want to see and learn from other countries in the English speaking world, for example. U.S. is right here somewhere, on my right here, okay? And so uh, what you are seeing now in U.S. is a cultural war, a big divide between traditional and secular, right? And a big divide between survival and self-expression as well. So in U.S. case, uh, you almost see a bipolar nation being torn into two, right? So Singapore right now is a very balanced point here. So what are some of the things we really need to seriously consider if we were to develop our, our students here for the future, especially in society, in learning? We have to think about mechanisms to develop intercultural acumen and so on. So let's take a look at another uh, part of our development for learning. We know that in living, it's not just a society, but also the environmental challenges are absolutely important. So what are some of the environmental challenges that we face in Singapore, and then what is the trajectory, okay? And this is a, almost like a mantra that I hope you will remember this, that when we increase in urbanization, it will result in increase in consumption of metal and energy, okay? Here's a picture of that. Metal is defined as everything, physical infrastructure, food and water, et cetera. Energy is about electricity, sunlight, electromagnetic spectrum, okay? Here's a picture of Singapore, uh, uh, 2000. And, and now, and you can see the pace of urbanization, right? So we've increased urbanization, with Singapore is moving towards greater and greater increased urbanization. There will be greater and greater consumption of matter and energy. So the key question then, therefore, where are we drawing the sources of energy from? And here is a map, here is a table rather, which I took from uh, SP Global. It shows that Singapore depends on 95% of the source for uh, electrical consumption and so on, electricity from fossil fuel, right? Natural gas is the most, uh, is the highest, highest, highest amount. But if you take a look at it, 
other others means that, like for example, we are thinking and talking about natural renewable resources is only a very small percentage. So if we see this particular trend, it's a great worry for all of us that if we keep depending on fossil fuel to generate the better and energy that we need, then therefore we will always be held at ransom by the fluctuating prices and wars that are going on. So therefore, if you take a look at here, certainly the direction here is that to prepare our future ready learners for the environmental challenges, they really need to have certain mindset and certain skill set to be able to come up with new ways to utilize our, our resources, okay? Now let's take a look at another aspect of it here, which is development for learning, right? Now in Singapore, we have been participating in teams and PISA on a regular basis and we have consistently been doing well. And also we have been consistently doing well as measured by the Cambridge O-level and A-level results, right? So on that note, development for learning is not going to be focusing on increasing that mastery of little more percentage of it in order to achieve 100%, right? So based on the entire context, two of which I've shared with you uh, in the economics as well as environmental, and of course, the third, trip, uh, the third context is society, that presents us some of the things, some of the ways to look at how do we develop learners for learning to be able to deal with all the, the kind of involvement and changes that we, that we are seeing. So here is something that I want to share, uh, useful to think about. Now in my work and definition of uh, future ready learners, based on the process that I've just shared with you just now, and the basis on defining that is country specific, based on trends and plans by our government, right? So in, in that, I've identified the trajectory where these three purposes of education are heading. And of course, the skills, knowledge, and values needed for them to be able to fulfill the trajectory and the changes in, and, and involvement in down the road. Okay. Now, so in my work, I've identified two aspects. Huh? Value creation is very much needed. So there are two points of value creation here. And almost at the same time, um, without consulting each other and independently, I found that OECD has also come up with their learning framework for 2030, where they have identified one of the three uh, transforming competencies for young people. And one of those competencies, transforming competencies is creating new value. So there is concurrence in determining the direction for learning for our learners here, which is really about helping them to create new value or what I call value creation. So what does value creation looks like in the future of learning in Singapore? Here's one example. Uh, this is the, the example that was quite well uh, uh, reviewed and uh, published uh, way back in 2011, all right? Sorry, not 2011, this was in, uh, I think it was 2018, 2019, right? Where the students turn food waste into worm tea fertilizer. So you see, when you take a look at this particular cycle of value creation, students went through this process of uh, uh, learning sustainability, environmental things and biology and sciences and so on. And they have the immediate value of being able to know and be able to do well in the exam, okay? So they started thinking about what can we do potentially? So potential value is how about let's start a project on turning it into fertilizer. Then they apply it and well, it's successful. Now, what about using this and maybe offering it to the neighborhood, which they did realize value beyond just only in the school where they introduced this to the water nesting, okay? So this is part of the process of value creation, but we are short of one more step which is this particular way to reframe waste into fertilizer, we have not gone through one more step in value creation, which is about reframing value. So at a school level, for example, a reframe value will be, has it redefined successful learning and apply as a new assessment criteria in school? Not just only about this particular project, but the way we think about applying knowledge or applying solutions in, in project work and so on. 
So again, reframe value also at the community level as it helped Walton Estate residents rethink waste and see value in turning waste to fertilizer and so on. Okay? So this is one example where uh, the focus on future ready learning, the, the part about learning itself, yeah, this is something that we have been doing well, but we can certainly push it one or two steps further, okay, depending on where we are in this, in this cycle. And so my work then therefore has come up with this mapping of the Singapore's context, the direction, the trajectory in life work, in living and in learning. And so I came up with this very generic definition of a successful education system, which is we, the successful education system, developing future ready learners must be able to continue, develop learners who will be able to learn beyond graduation. So we, we, I talk uh, in that work here is I talk about lifelong, life work and life deep learning. Take on future life work that is evolving and changing, but still based on a certain trend and trajectory that we can identify and certainly thrive in a changing society and environment, okay? Now, having said all those, then some of the things we really seriously need to think about here is that where are we now in our journey in future readiness, preparation, development for our learners? Then seriously consider what two important shifts needed in teaching and learning in order to meet future readiness. Okay? So much of this is uh, found in my work, uh, and of course in this particular slide here in annexes three to seven, okay? But I felt that it is also something which can be done by every school, right? And uh, in a school where we are able to create a repetitive learning environment. And so I was not focusing just only on competencies, I took a look at the competencies and I asked myself this question, what are the fundamental building blocks for these competencies? And I uh, could derive from the competencies these six habits, I call it habits of practices that we can develop uh, among our learners. If you have a habit of inquisitiveness, habit of coming up with ideas, turning the ideas into prototype, doing the reframing part and being able to share the idea and change values on entrepreneurship. Certainly intercultural acumen, not just only to understand, accept, but also to be able to work together, right? And of course, passion. So in my work, I, I propose that habits will probably be a very good starting point for school to be build this future readiness so that the competencies can be built upon them. So if you take a look at value creation, innovation, and so on, value creation, innovation will always start with being inquisitive and starting with an idea, turning the idea into a prototype. And if that works, convincing people to accept that change and so on. So this is something for us to think about. So in a very short sharing just now, uh, what I've just shared with you here is the way for us to think carefully about future readiness should not be just only from what we see uh, publications from international publications or even OECD led uh, uh, focus on the future competencies and so on, but going back to uh, the context of Singapore, right? Singapore specifically at the context in the economy, society, environment, of course, overall learning and so on. So a question for us to think about future readiness for our learners here is how do we develop fundamental habits? In this case, for example, value creation in teaching and learning. So my work uh, is, uh, I'm happy to share my work here with, uh, with, with the link, um, but this work has also been shared uh, in different countries shared with the US, they have adopted part of the work and uh, use it to come, come up with a uh, new publication called The Time Is Now. And it is a publication to endorse future ready uh, learning in US for all the states, as well as it also, also part of the work in the U UN General Assembly, uh, as well as for Colombia and so on. So with that, uh, thank you very much. I'm right on time. and. Uh, I hand the rest of the time back to Travina. Thank you, David. Um, I think it's an excellent reminder for us to think about um, the building blocks and habits of practice 
that we may require if we are to launch into the future.